I confess that I originally picked up the book because of the title, which as it turned out doesn't have the slightest thing to do with anything in the book. The back cover has a caution sign with the words which side are you on, which also has about the same relation to the contents as that of a James Bond movie with Daniel Craig. Who the hell designed the Advanced Magic for Beginners isn't overtly political, so which side are you on could refer just as easily to a difference in analogical positions as it could be the dialogue of two kids playing Mario Tennis who can't figure out which character is being moved by their controller. The fact of the matter is that the book is, if anything, the opposite of political. It's often happy to just describe the objects and events of the poet's life without shoehorning his commentary into it. Here's a full poem called Photosyn. The tree outside my window has got its leaves back, obliterating my view of the road. Big and plentiful and green, the re-emergence means that now I just have to suffer the noise of the mutant army that gathers and quarrels restlessly with itself before threatening to smash up the car belonging to the Lithuanians who live somewhere to the left of the corner shop. It's hot and it's late and rovers have beaten FC and everybody has gone insane myself included. Notice there isn't any attempt to investigate what being insane means, it's just a situation that is presented to the reader. This is a refreshingly selfless approach and perhaps a necessary one because of the book's topic, which is, in brief, that of having no money, working shit jobs, being addicted to alcohol and drugs, and generally not living the lifestyle of a Tom Cruise. This topic kind of has to be treated with neutrality, because the point of being poor is that it renders commentary superfluous. The poem, Note to Self, just lists a bunch of things like When you sleep in your coat because the flat's too cold When the cooker is broken and the telly's on the blink When the toilet's blocked and you have to piss in the sink It may not be especially sophisticated, but that's kind of the point When you're living through this kind of shit, you don't really give a damn about clever metaphors, illusion, and onopatomeia <coughs> Clever metaphors, illusion, and onometapoia <coughs> Clever metaphors, illusion, and onomatopoia Clever metaphors, illusion, and Kamehameha. Boy, that escalated quickly. In discussing these topics, the book can be very touching, especially when Hey Kim represents the relationship between poverty and fantasy and seems to suggest that poverty is, precisely, a state in which you are not allowed to imagine yourself in a different situation. This is not just an interesting point, it's also very relatable and surprisingly accessible. But what I found surprising was that the book was actually quite funny, not in the sense that you find in every review out there that says this poetry book is frequently hilarious, and then it turns out they're talking about Dante's Inferno. No, I actually found myself laughing here, which doesn't happen to me all that often with poetry. And the result was that I whizzed through the whole collection in just a couple of days with a huge sense of enjoyment. This isn't to say that the book is exempt from flaws. In fact, Joe, you might want to skip the next couple of minutes of the review if you still want to harbor the belief that you be the man, because I'm about to get rough here. So, Hakem has a compelling subject matter and a good sense of humor, but he's simply a terrible technician. His attempts at rhyme are clunky and feel like the kind of thing that 16-year-olds publish on the internet. When he tries to be formally clever or experimental, he's like Wall E. Coyote with an Acme box, for instance in the ending to take whatever you want. After a long and not entirely unpleasant list of This poem is about running out of milk when you're desperate for a brew. This poem is about living in the middle of an economic crisis and not caring because you've always been skimped anyway. This poem is about punching someone in the face. It ends with the earth-shattering cliché of This poem is about blank line, which feels kind of like Johnny Cage's fatality in Mortal Kombat X. I don't overly blame Hakim for this, because when you read his actual articles, it becomes clear he's not exactly the most nuanced of thinkers. I still think that creativity is an essential part of life, especially here in Britain. Our music, film, literature and art are the best in the world, in my humble opinion, and they are some of the things that make us as a nation great. Whoa. This is like your humble opinion? So what does an article look like when you write it in your normal opinion? Perhaps even more infuriating than his technical shortcomings is his fucking grammar. The book has so many spelling and grammar mistakes or simply typos that it drove me up the wall. That bloke sat there, that bloke sat next to the girl, that bloke with a bogey on the end of noise that he doesn't know about. On the end of... on the end of what? On the end of noise? 
You mean on the end of 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 his nose? Uh, I mean, the first time I thought maybe this was like a metaphorical expression, some uh, interesting use of language. But no, because later on he says it's awkward when he finally finds out he has a bogey on the end of his nose. So he did. He does mean nose, having fleeting subjective empirical experience and trying to crystallize it, trying to grant it immortality. Yeah, well, yeah, well crystallize it is with two L's, I believe. They start talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger, and they open a drawer and file some discs. Eventually, they decide to leave with empty carrier bags. Eventually, should be capitalized, mate. They don't make these kind of mistakes when writing sex motel reviews on TripAdvisor. They reshape the concrete and steel body of the bridge into a structure that spans much more than water. A, a structure that spans much more than water? Then you see this guy who was in the same year at school, a beached whale of a bloke whose only line of converse Oh. My. In all honesty, some of this stuff is frankly high school level bad. I don't think I've ever felt so embarrassed for a poet since that time Andrew Motion got cut off in one of his readings by these kids playing football. Well, even though formally it's a very different sort of operation, clearly because the lines go to the end of the page, I wrote that book in a state of excitement that was rather like the state of... <laughs> Now, I've ranted about the poet having some talents, but being in dire need of a better English tutor than George Bush Jr. But how do I actually rate this book? Now, this is where things get complicated. See, I honestly don't think this is very good poetry, but the subject matter is just so close to my heart that this alone made it one of the most touching books of poetry I've read in a while. I started reading contemporary English poetry seriously when I came to London in summer 2012 to find myself a job, and it took eight months of part-time, freelance, temporary contracts and minimum wage before I could find something to actually live on, which turned out to be a receptionist at a hotel. Over those eight months I lived in hostels with other immigrants like me, or I shared a flat with a drug dealer who held me at knife point, or I worked in the underground or in supermarkets or selling beers in stadiums or I deliberately skipped meals to try and save money. In the meantime, the first poetry book that I was recommended was Sam Riviere's 81 Austerities, the very first poem of which opens like this. In three years I have been awarded £48,000 by various funding bodies, councils and publishing houses for my contributions to the art. My work has thrived since 2008. I have written 20 or 21 poems, developed a taste for sushi, decent wine, bought my acquaintances many beers, many of whom have never worked a day in their lives. Now, I know that Riviera is being funny, in the same sense that Dante's Inferno is funny, which it isn't. But in the years since, Advanced Magic for Beginners is literally the first book of contemporary English poetry I've read that actually addresses the question of class inequality from the point of view of someone who's in the lower end of it. I mean, The Customer is Always Wrong is a pretty elementary poem starting from its title, but it's the first poem I found in a published collection that is about the service industry, which just so happens to be where I work. Now this is not to say that nobody is writing about these things, but if you were to ask me what books deal with the question of, uh, say, home and homecoming, I could quote you at the drop of a hat Jen Hadfield's Bisses, Claire Trevian's The Shipwrecked House, Maurice Riordan's The Holy Land, Glyn Maxwell's Pluto, Alice Oswald's Dart, and the Emma Press's Homesickness and Exile Anthology, all of which I came across in the last couple of years alone. If I want poems about unemployment and poverty in the UK today, the only surefire way I know is to turn to performance poets, who generally suffer from the same problems Hakim does. What if I told you that all great European philosophers were trained by black Africans in Iona? So I'm going to give this book a rating of 4 bad metaphors out of 5. Not because it's particularly good, but simply because it is about a relevant topic I haven't found seriously discussed anywhere else. And if there are 247 posts out there already writing about all these things and I simply never happen to come across them, then you can throw my credibility as a critic in the garbage, like this. Oh my god, yes, yeah, see, I knew something told me to come to this neighborhood. Fuck a five dollars, I got seven on this shit. Wait, he about to do it, he about to do it. Oh shit! Oh my god, yo, yo, somebody get this motherfucker a blanket. He is not getting back up. Oh shit, yo, yo, I guess you could say that jump was 
garbage. Yo, you get it? Because he didn't make it to the ocean. <laughs>